Hi, and welcome to this lecture on the skeletal system for bone growth and bone remodeling. Bone growth and remodeling actually begins during embryologic development, even before you're born. There are two kinds. You have the interstitial growth, which is growth in length, and you have appositional growth, which is growth in diameter. We are going to talk about interstitial growth first. Here is a picture showing an x-ray of a young individual in which you can see the epiphyseal plates. Now, epiphyseal plates is where interstitial growth happens. They generally maintain their thickness during childhood. As an individual grows older, the growth at these plates slows down. It will eventually narrow until it disappears. At that point, the interstitial growth stops. And at the end of it, instead of these plates where you see these spaces, you'll actually see it be completely ossified and there will be a line there called the epiphyseal line. Now in interstitial growth, that is a bone growth in length. It occurs in this specific part of the epiphyseal plate. We are going to take a look at that next. Now here is a figure showing the cartilage in the epiphyseal plates. As you can see, there are five different zones within the epiphyseal plate. Zone 1 is the zone of resting cartilage. It is nearest to the epiphysis. It is composed of small chondrocytes distributed throughout the matrix. You can see those here. It resembles hyaline cartilage and it helps secure the epiphysis to the epiphyseal plate. Now the chondrocytes that you have in zone 1 are going to contribute to zone 2. In zone 2, that is the zone of proliferating cartilage, which is one of the zones in which you have interstitial growth. Here, chondrocytes undergo rapid mitotic division, and they become aligned into these columns. You can see these columns in this zone. These columns are parallel to the diaphysis, so they are growing in one direction. In zone 3, you have the zone of hypertrophic cartilage. Here, the chondrocytes cease to divide, and they begin to grow in size, which is hypertrophy. And the walls on the sides of the lacuna begin to get thinner. In zone 4, this is the zone of calcified cartilage. Here it is only composed of two to three layers of chondrocytes. And you have minerals that are beginning to be deposited between the columns of lacunae. And as these minerals are deposited, it destroys the chondrocytes, which leads to zone 5, which is the zone of ossification. Here, the walls break down between the lacuna in the columns, and the spaces are invaded by capillaries in osteoprogenitor cells, which are cells that will give rise to osteoblasts or osteoclasts. And if there are osteoblasts made here, this will form the new bone matrix that will later be ossified in this zone. In the epiphyseal plate, it maintains this thickness during childhood. And as you get older, it slows down. It will eventually narrow until it disappears and interstitial growth stops. In addition to interstitial growth, you also have appositional growth. And appositional growth is the bone growth in diameter. It occurs within the periosteum, which is the lining on the outside of the bone. You have bone matrix that is deposited within layers parallel to its surface. So if this is the edge of your bone, it is deposited parallel to increase the diameter of the bone. These layers are termed circumferential lamellae. So as you get more of these lamellae, the structure increases in diameter. And as you add these layers, on the inside, which is the medullary cavity, which would be here, osteoclasts are resorbing bone. This will transform the infant bone into the larger adult version. Here's a figure showing the process. In an infant, here is the size of the bone. You have the periosteum, which is the lining on the outside. Then on the inside, you have the medullary cavity. As you can see, in a child, the bone is deposited by osteoblasts, creating the circumferential lamellae. At the same time, in the medullary cavity, you have bone being resorbed by osteoclasts. So the bone growth is proportional up through young adult into adulthood. 
Now bone remodeling is a continual process of bone deposition and resorption that is typically occurring at the same time. It continues throughout adulthood. It will occur at the periosteum or periosteal surface and the endosteum or the endosteal surfaces of a bone. It does occur at different rates. For example, parts of the femur are replaced every four to six months on average whereas the diaphysis of a femur is never completely replaced over a lifetime. On average, approximately 20% of an individual skeleton is replaced yearly, and it is completely dependent on the coordinated activities of osteoblasts, which are cells that build bone, osteoclasts, which are cells that resorb bone, and osteocytes, which are cells that help maintain bone. One of the factors that can affect bone growth and bone remodeling is mechanical stress. It is termed Wolf's Law of Bone. This mechanical stress occurs in weight-bearing movement and exercises. The more you do of those, the more stress it places on the bone and the more that the bone has to respond. It is required for normal bone remodeling. Now this stress is detected by osteocytes. Keep in mind osteocytes are to maintain bone and this is communicated to osteoblasts that will build it. The osteoblasts will then start to synthesize osteoid which is the organic component of bone. It is then calcified to cause an increase in bone strength and usually results from skeletal contraction or skeletal muscle contraction and gravitational forces. Both of these are placing this, the mechanical stress on the bone. For example, a person that is hiking often is generally going to have thicker bones than an individual that does not, simply because of the extra stress that the bones have to withstand. To get increased bone mass, you get that from weight-bearing activities, weightlifting, walking, running, hiking, etc. And you can increase your total bone mass throughout the lifetime. You get decreased bone mass from removal of the mechanical stress, so you either keep it by doing those activities or you will lose it. Use it or lose it. During decreased bone mass you get reduced collagen formation. Keep in mind that collagen is a type of fiber found in bone and demineralization that is losing the calcium or hydroxyapatite that you find in bone. It causes decreased strength Hormones are also important in bone growth and remodeling. Keep in mind, hormones are molecules released from one cell into the blood. They travel throughout the body to affect other cells. However, they only affect cells that have the cellular receptors for that specific hormone. If that cell has a receptor, it will initiate a specific cellular change within that cell. And that change can be things such as altering the rates of chondrocytes, osteoblast, and osteoclast activity. And if you do that, you are going to affect the rate of bone composition and bone growth. One example of this is a growth hormone. You may also see it called somatotropin. It is produced by the anterior pituitary gland called the adenohypophysis and it stimulates the liver to produce another hormone called somatomaidin. Both directly stimulate growth of the cartilage in the epiphyseal plate. And if you stimulate the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate, then you're going to get increased interstitial growth in that bone. A second hormone is the thyroid hormone, secreted by the thyroid gland and it influences the basal metabolic rate of bone cells or how those cells produce energy. This helps regulate the normal activity at the epiphyseal plates. For example, if you have hypothyroidism, that which is low thyroid levels, you will have impaired skeletal growth. We also have the sex hormones, estrogen and testosterone, estrogen being the female sex hormone and testosterone being the male sex hormone, predominantly. They begin to be secreted in large amounts at puberty. They dramatically accelerate bone growth. Why? Because they increase the rate of cartilage growth 
in the epiphyseal plate. And if you increase cartilage growth, that becomes ossified and increases bone formation. This causes interstitial growth or an increased length of long bones. And here's the neat thing, is that bone formation at these plates is greater than the cartilage growth. So over time, you're creating more bone faster than you're creating cartilage. This will eventually cause all the cartilage to be replaced with bone, ceasing growth typically in early adulthood after the age of 18 and the growth plate will close more quickly in response to estrogen which is why that females are typically done growing faster than males. Glucocorticoids are a group of steroid hormones that are released from the adrenal cortex which is found on the kidneys. They help regulate the blood glucose level. Now blood glucose is used by cells to create energy. Cortisol is the primary glucocorticoid. You may have heard of it before. If you have high amounts, it increases bone loss. It impairs the growth at the epiphyseal plate in children. If that child is receiving a high dose of glucocorticoids, example in asthma, which is it is used to help regulate the problems of asthma, they have to monitor bone loss in that child. Serotonin, it is a neurotransmitter and a hormone. Most bones have serotonin receptors. It plays a role in both the rate and regulation of normal bone remodeling. If the levels are too high, the osteoprogenitor cells, which are cells that give rise to osteoblasts and osteoclasts, are not prevented from becoming osteoblasts. Gives you too much bone growth.